Well, I thought I would do this the proper way. On page two of her book, she tells us all her names. Philippa, Anne, Namteri, Nalwoza, Nalwoga, Nambuya, Mutua, Muyama, Muihaki. And she was born in 1964. Women don't usually say their age. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Philippa, very good morning and welcome to Morning at NTV. Well, good morning and thank you for having me. So all these names, I mean, how many names are on your passport? So these are like nine no, names. No, not all of them are on my passport. Okay. But, but I always think, uh, as African children, you always have an aunt who calls you this and an aunt who calls you that. And you acquire names and I keep a record of all the names I am called. And, and they're all of your clan, I would imagine. Mm. Nambuya, Nalwoga, Nalwoza, Namtevi. Nam, Nalwoga was given to me and Nalwoza by my parents. Namtevi is my clan name. And I didn't have a clan name until I was about seven or eight. And then we went to Jajanu Asamatimba and he gave me Namtevi. <laughs> and then Muyama and Mutua are from my mother's side of the family. And Muihaki, my Kenyan mother, when we lived in exile, gave me the name Wihaki. Okay. So it's my Kikuyu name. It's your Kikuyu name. Yeah, <laughs> I was looking at it and I was like, mm, this was a bit... Uh, yeah, but your father, Henry Ballo, you didn't use his name? I did. Was a I did, but poet. I'm married. And so, you know, our gener generation, you get married, you change your name, you know? Okay. Yes. And uh, so I am Ballo. Probably if my mother was alive, I would have written this book as Philippa Namtevi Ballo. Okay, <laughs> but you decided that, you know. It was okay. It's it was okay. fine. Yeah. So this wonderful book you've written, Flame and Song, where mm -hmm. you mix story writing with poetry, yes. and it's basically about your life. Yes. Um, where do I start? Why the title of this song, of um, this book, Flame and Song? The title, Flame and Song. Uh, when I was organizing the book, I used the image of fire because I felt like life is like fire. First of all, the starting point in the family, it's like a hearth where you sit around the warm fire. But sometimes things are hard and life, you know, it's like it burns like a fire or you burn with passion or you burn with joy. And when it's sad and it's not working, it feels like you're sitting in ashes. But always when you touch in the ashes, when you think it's all finished and nothing is there, you, you'll find an ember, something that still burns. And if you nurture that and blow it, the fire will burn again and so and I like singing um, and there's lots of poetry and song like things in the book so that then became the title. We'll actually ask you to read a little bit okay. uh, from the book a bit later but why did you choose to write this story and why now? Okay so both my parents had passed away and I was sitting in Cape Town in South Africa um, and feeling like I am now an elder in the family, but also asking myself, what am I doing here? Because I'd lived in Cape Town the longest anywhere in my life. So it started as a grieving process, um, a reflection on what led me to South Africa, what led me to live away from home. And then I realized as I was reflecting on the 60s and 70s that Uganda was turning 50, many African countries were turning 50, I was turning 50, <laughs> and I was saying, um, the stories of African countries are about the politicians, about the crises, you know, Idi Amin, Obote, um, HIV and AIDS. Those things are in the news, but real people lived in those times. And I wanted to tell that story. And I felt that we, our generation, our parents' generation, has not really spoken about those, those times. They were painful, they were difficult, but they were not only painful. There was also joy and laughter, and I felt it was important to share that story. Um, and so the book was born. Yeah. Where you talk mainly about your family here, mm. um, but you know how life was like in the 60s and 70s. You know, mm. um, for us now, obviously. What we read, we just think about maybe a bit of colonialism. Mm -hmm. We think of Idi Amin, the reign of terror, and yes. there's not actually much that we know. Um, for you during that time, did it feel like normal? Was it what, because I would imagine, you know, that's what you had been born into. Or did you have hope that things could actually get better? Because I wasn't born into the terror. In the 60s, um, we, you know, Kampala Road, there was Nel Sadri's, <laughs> there was Christo's, which was a bakery, which was like the best bread in town and the best sausage rolls. 
Um, there were sausage rolls in the 60s. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we would go to Sardinia's, which still exists. It's New one of Sardinia. The sar opposite okay. the National Theatre. Yes, Theater. I know the place. It, it was there in the 60s and the most delicious food. And still owned by one of the original. Helena. I know Helena. And Catherine, Helena. Uh, you know, the same family. Um, we would go to the National Theatre when it was independence celebrations. Um, or we were celebrating the 9th of October, there'd be fireworks um, on Kololo Airstrip and we'd all go there. There'd be floats through Kampala town. Um, yeah, uh, we lived on Chitante Road and you know the golf course was there and we would run across and play. Um, so that was the late 60s, early 70s. Then Amin took over and the terror the thing I've learned in my life is terror doesn't happen immediately. It seeps in slowly. Um, so the first few years of Amin weren't so scary. And then it became harder and harder. And I think that's the thing that we need to learn, that we need to be awake when things start going bad because you might not notice and then you'll wake up and find yourself in a very hard place. Okay, you left uh, in the book. You say after Janan Luwum uh, killed, what was yes. that like? Because this, I think they had said he he died in an accident mm -hmm. or something. But mm -hmm. you all knew at the time that he couldn't have died in an accident. Yeah, I, the funny and the thing was at that age because people often think children don't know things. So you would overhear the things the parents are saying. You could feel the fear. Um, there was a sense of of doom, and for us as a family. Before that, I think late 75, my father had been arrested. We were lucky he can, came back. Many other people's fathers were not brought back. Um, then Janani Luwum was killed. And I think, no, before that, my father had left. So I think my parents were planning on leaving. And when um, Luwum was killed, my mother uh, decided we needed to leave because I had two handicapped siblings. Yeah. And I think one of her greatest concerns was if things became really bad, how could she leave? What would she do with two handicapped children? And, and so we left. Okay, it must have been quite hard for you as a little child. Initially it was exciting. It was exciting to <laughs> until, live in Uganda. Until um, we ended up living, uh, my dad in Ethiopia, my eldest sister in the States, me and my mom and my other siblings in Kenya and my other sister in Uganda. And so from being a whole family together, we were split apart, um, no cousins, n you know, having to help with shopping and things like that. And then it became hard. Okay. Mm. There is a bit of pain in this book. And I want to yes. know, how were you able to write through the pain? Is, um, it, is writing therapeutic for you, maybe? It is. Um, writing is how I make sense of things. Um, but I cried. I mean, you know, you can't say you wrote and you did. You know, you write certain things, you remember, you cry, you put it aside, you go, you do other things, you come back. But I think it's important to, to go back to those places and to, to heal them. And the only way you can heal them is by speaking them, by honoring them, by looking at them, by letting myself know that I am now living in 2016 or whatever. I'm not there. I have perspective now. I can deal with it. Okay. And and so that for me is really what the book has done for me. And it's helped me talk about things that we haven't talked about and then people remember. So I'm having interesting conversations with friends, with my family. Do they agree with everything you've written? Uh, not necessarily, <laughs> but that's not the point because <laughs> it's my story. And it's if they story. were to tell their story, it would be different. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay, I think at this point I'll ask you to read. You said you wanted to read a poem about your father. Yeah. I believe. Okay. Uh, okay. Philippa, as she reads from her book Flame and Song. Okay. Our parents did their best to keep the horror of the regime away from us. But even our parents have limitations. Velvet skies. Eleven years old and afraid we have lost my father forever. Three days ago he was taken from his office to Naguru. Zubga came home driving like a maniac. He told Mama. And now the house is full of people that we keep serving tea. Are they mourning him? Are they praying? Are they planning ways to bring him back? 
My heart is heavy. Many others have been taken and never returned. I retreat to the only place I can be alone, the bathroom. As I run the bath, I remember Mama saying calmly on that first day, Your father has been taken, but don't worry, we'll be all right. I believe her. She was later allowed to visit him, and when she returned, she said, Your father said he loves you. No matter what happens, you must walk tall, with your head held up high. He has done nothing wrong. Tears roll down my face. The comforting warmth of the water enfolds me. I stare at the velvety skies through the frosted glass window. Light blue, deeper blue, purply blue. It's dusk. God made this time specially. God, I speak in our special time alone. God, let Daddy come home today. I'm praying for all of us. Mama, Maliza, Estella, Faye, Chris and me. Finished, I look up. The sky is now blackened, my fingers old and wrinkled. I slip on my pyjamas and walking down the stairs, headlights sweep into the driveway. I hear the pounding in my chest as I peer through the French windows. A white Datsun with UVS number plates stops in front of the house. The car doors open and out he steps. Daddy! I scream and start to let him in. Behind him, a dark man follows. Shh, say the adults as they push me away. I don't know their fear, but many have been returned only to be taken again or killed at the door. Daddy, I say, squeezing past them, hugging him. We are wrapped in velvety skies. The man in the shadows looks on. You are happy to see your daddy, he asks. Silently, we walk into the house and lock the doors. Daddy is back. Black turns to velvet. Wow, very beautiful, uh, Philippa. Yes. I, I want to ask you now, why did you choose to write this? Um, well, this is a very unique writing style, <laughs> where you add poetry into mm. your, your, you know, your storytelling. They're, they're different. Uh, I mean, here, death of the Archbishop, the drums beat, calling them to chapel that night, and. You know, where did that come from? I, I followed the story. So, so some incidents, some stories wanted to be told in poetry. I could only write them as poems. And you were big. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and other things came out as prose. And some things might have started as prose. And then as I edited, I, I changed them into poetry. So it was really... I think one of the things as a writer and as a storyteller is you have to be true to the story. A lot of people say, who is your audience? For me, the question is not, always, not necessarily who's the audience. What is the story that is asking to be told? And how best can I tell that story at this moment? So you basically have no control. The story, the poetry, the prose dictates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've had people say that and I guess it's, it's one of those things if you don't understand it, it's very difficult to explain but I mm. do understand what you're saying the mm. story wanted to be told that way yeah. and you obeyed and mm. told the story as it is mm. um, What influence did your father have on your writing? Because your father was a poet mm. Mm. I think People mm. actually study his poems in school yes. in the Uganda mm. curriculum, mm. Henry Ballo uh, for those of you uh, who did poet literature mm. in, in school mm. I, I will say both my parents, my mother and my father. My mother was an amazing storyteller um, and my father was a poet and they both encouraged me to read and when we were young we would go to poetry things with them um, and we would read their poems. I think for me um, some of my father's poems are autobiographical and I think I enjoyed that style. I, I felt when I read that I got permission to write um, stories as poems as opposed to writing with deep complicated words. I'm not, a, I'm not a complicated writer. I don't like big words. I want to be as simple and as clear as possible um, because I think there's power um, in the simple. In the simple. Yeah. Well, 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 what are you reading at the moment? Well, what I is there anything? That uh, what have I recently read? Um, I recently read, I read Chintu by um, Makumbi. 
Jennifer Makumbi. Beautiful book. Anybody in Uganda needs to read it. In fact, yesterday, Professor Taban Lonyong said it's the best book to come out of Uganda, and I think so. <laughs> it gives you deep perspective into our society. Um, I read Dust by Yvonne Awar from Kenya. Also, it's um, also fiction, but very deeply based on the history of Kenya. Beautiful book. Beautiful book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, you are of another generation. Okay. You're not, <laughs> not exactly another generation, yes, but yeah. um, 2017 now, mm -hmm. there's, uh, social media has, okay, not social media, but the, the internet and computers have revolutionized yes. reading. And people tend to look at physical books as static, mm -hmm. while social media, uh, these computers we have, the gadgets mm -hmm. and you know, the software that comes with it, mm -hmm. is seen as dynamic. Yeah. And you find younger people, I do not know, are, someone once said, you know, they live their lives with, you know, in 140 characters, which is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, do you see, or in your, what has your experience been with younger people and the reading culture? Um, I think, I think it's shifting. I think that they are young people who really do like literature. I think um, they're young people who challenge us to say, literature can exist in different ways. Um, as a storyteller, for me, my commitment is to the story first. So even when I write, I might read certain passages out loud to see if they have the right rhythm, if they are... Can you hear it? Can I hear it? Is it sounding the way it needs to be? But there are many ways to tell a story, you know? Um, film, you could use... They're interactive, they're books e-books that have film and all sorts of things in them, which I think is really exciting. But nothing beats holding your book, <laughs> smelling your book, writing in your book, um, putting it on the bookshelf two years later, you know, go, you know, or reading it and going back, you know, and, and, and saying, okay, I didn't get that. Can I just go back and then go forward? You can't do that in the same way with, with social media. With, no. with Kindle on your no. phone, you, you know, you just And your eyes and get <laughs> tired. No, you know. So nothing beats a book for me. Um, uh, but, but I agree there are many ways and they, they are, they're valid. Okay. Mm. Um, at the start, I asked you, you know, one of the reasons you wrote this book and you said you feel not much has been told mm. of you, Uganda's past mm. and that. Uh, if we don't talk about it, we will somehow, we don't heal from our pain and we probably, um, you know, we'll find ourselves in a similar situation so mm. many years later. I can explain more. Um, yeah, if, if, if we don't know where we've been, if we don't know who we are, if we don't know where we're coming from, it's very difficult to move forward. I think... Um, in many ways, there's a lot of pain in Uganda. I, I'm struck by watching TV, the news, and, and seeing how many people have been assassinated lately. That worries me. That makes me think it's like 1979 when my uncle died. People were killed randomly and nobody knew who was doing that. But your generation doesn't know that. There are people who don't know that time. Um, so it's important to know that. But it's also important to know the shoulders on which we stand. Um, for me, the story about Uganda and independence was, was kind of told like the British handed us independence. And over the years, I realized, no, people fought for that independence. My, my uncle, Musazi, my, my grandfather, my father's uncle, he started the first political Ignatius party. Ignatius Musazi? Yes. Oh. He was my, my father's mother's brother. My father's Kodja. Okay. <laughs> um, mm. But... We don't talk about that. And oh, we studied him in school. In we, didn't, that, uh, we didn't. Oh, Our, okay. We didn't. Maybe I'm glad now he <laughs> is on the, on the curriculum because we didn't. But, but we need to know where we come from. We need to know who our heroes were. We need to know there are people in our communities who have stood up against things that are wrong, who have fought for social justice. Um, we need to know that there was a time when corruption wasn't a thing and where people didn't say, ah, this is Uganda. No, we, we can change things. We need to not be, have a apathy around Mulago not functioning. Mulago was one of the best hospitals in East Africa. Makere was one of the best universities in Africa. We come from great people. 
we can be great again, but we can only be great again. And I'm not saying it like Trump, but we, yeah. <laughs> but we can, we, we do have the capacity if we remember where we came from and who we are. Okay. Yeah. Well, Philippa Namtevi here with a beautiful book about life in Uganda, her family's story. Uh, but she also talks about life generally in Uganda in the 1960s, 70s, and a little bit, she said, of the 80s. Flame and Song, a memoir. Uh, and as she has said it very well, we do need to know um, where we have been Mm. and it will inform where we're going to. You know, Uganda, about, they say, 50% of our population is below 15, and then another 75% mm. are below, I don't know, 18 or 21? Mm. Or 30. <laughs> oh, and you're like, oh, my goodness. Yes. Uh, the people in their 60s and 70s are really uh, very few. Uh, but and we have a job to do, to, to mentor, to teach, to, to help shape. You know, I think that intergenerational conversations are very important. And what's been powerful for me at many of my book launches is to have the young people there with the old people and have those conversations. Let the old people cry about the pain. Let them release that pain if they need to. But you need to know who you are. Flame and song. Uh, I'm about to say a discovery <laughs> for her, uh, but it is a beautiful book. Thanks. And uh, I've met some people here in our newsroom who have read the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, it comes highly recommended. You can find it in bookstores uh, in and around Kampala. Morning Attentive, we'll be taking a short break.